We, I'm going to set up an edger according to the specs, and then I'm going to show you guys how I set it up. So everyone knows we're at an NWFA class in Chesterfield, Missouri. This is the advanced sand and finish class. We're going to use multiple colors, all kinds of different stains, water-based dyes, and all those things. It's important to get your edger dialed in when you're doing custom work like we're doing here. If your edger digs in, leaves a gouge, uh, if it doesn't run smooth, all it's doing is fighting you and you're not going to have the opportunity to make the best looking floor that you can. Things you have to remember about the edger pad, uh, I'm on multiple Facebook groups and a lot of guys say you have to dress the edger pad flat, it has to be flat. Well, you don't want a flat edger pad. What you want is a pad with a two degree angle of deflection. It's already built into the pad. If you turn this upside down and we lay a straight edge across here, you're going to notice that it's hitting higher in the center than it does on the outside edge. That's the two degree angle of deflection right there. When you sand with the pad, at the end of the day, you'll notice your paper has a sanding path about an inch to inch and a half wide, depending on the unit. If it's a traditional edger like this, or if it's a combo edger, a combo edger is gonna cut a little bit flatter and, and fatter toward the center of the abrasives. Those adjustments are the, still the same thing. They're in the height of the casters. You don't mess with the pad. Now this unit here has an, a pad that you can get that's steel, so it, you can do the same thing. You can get a flatter surface. These pads will flex as you operate it. The rubber pad won't, so it's gonna be a little more aggressive. So if you go to a flex style pad or a metal style pad, you're gonna lose a little bit of aggressiveness, but you're gonna make up for it in finer scratch. If you stay with the traditional rubber pad, you're gonna be more aggressive, but you're gonna put a little heavier scratch that you gotta take out. So it's, it's what you like to do in your style. That's what you're after. However you, your style is, that's what you can do. The easiest way to set them up for a Super 7, you take three pennies. This is just three US pennies. Stack them on top of each other. And you wanna be able to slide it so that the frame sits on top of those pennies. Now this unit had the flex pad on it. You don't have to dress a flex pad. That's why it's two pennies taller. Because if you put a steel flex pad on a Super 7, you have to go to five US pennies on top of each other. So I'm gonna adjust this down so that I can rest on the three pennies. All I gotta do is take a wrench. There's a locking nut here, a locking nut here. And I'm gonna to try to get this while I reach around the edger. Once you get those loose, all you can do is turn the wheel, the caster bracket. You're just going to turn it up or down, depending on whatever you have to do. And obviously I've got to go down. So what I'm going to do is make the caster come out the top. So it's going to lower the whole frame. If I had to go, if I had to lower the, I mean, raise the frame, I would crank these down and it's going to pick up on the back. So I got a little bit of ways to go because we had this up on the flex pad. No, there is no same amount of turns on any of them. We're gonna set this up to cut right at 12 o'clock. Her question was, do you turn it equally? I don't have to worry about that because I'm gonna set it on top of these pennies and it's gonna, it's gonna dial itself right in. If I go too far, you're gonna notice the caster's not touching the top of the bench. And it's important, see the difference? I'm resting on the pennies. It's important to have a flat surface. You don't want something that's got a sag or a belly in it or a crown. Right now I'm sitting on the pennies. So I'm just gonna take these, crank it down until that ca caster hits the top of the bench top. That's it right there. Now I'm gonna lock the locking nuts in and then we're ready to dress the pad. I use the word dress it because we're just gonna condition it to this machine. If I set this machine up and I use this pad and I dress it, and I take this pad off and put it on the next edger, it's probably not gonna work as well, because you need to marry that pad to this edger. So that's why I do that. I'm gonna lock this in, and then we're gonna go down to the, to the dressing board that I have here. And if you, it'll make sense, right now this edger is going to cut right at 12 o'clock, dead center. I prefer to cut on the back side a little bit, 
like 11.30. Some guys like to cut a little bit at 12, 15, 12.30. <clears throat> I hear people all the time saying Ezra should cut at 2 o'clock. It's not going to cut at 2 o'clock. It was never designed to cut at 2 o'clock. I don't know how we got there. If you look at the way the frame is designed, you can't get tight to the wall. But if you cut at noon or around 11.30, that roller guard gets tight to the baseboard and the shoe mold. So that was originally designed to be that way from the get-go. So uh, don't set your edger up to cut at 2 o'clock. Does it matter what edger is? <clears throat> yes, it does. If it's a toe kick, those, you want to cut those on the right side because they're further out. So you're going to cut more on the right side to pull that scratch out. It's like you, you, you hit the brakes on a curve going into the curve and you accelerate coming out. A toe kick, because of the way they're designed, that you're going to get more power coming out of that than you are going into it. So it does matter on that. <clears throat> That's why I say I'm setting this back to manufacturer specs. Whatever the manufacturer of the edger you use, learn how to use it and learn how to set it up because it does make a difference. If you put a combo edger and you make it cut on the backside, you're going to lose a lot of aggressiveness on that edger. If you make it cut to 12 to 1, to maybe to 130, you're going to pick your aggressive cut back up. So that's important. That's a good question. All right, so now we're going to go down to the bottom here. <clears throat> I'm going to dress it. If you notice, I've got a piece of 60 grit. Uh, actually, all that is is drum sandpaper. And I uh, cut it. I took some contact cement and I glued it to that surface so that it stays flat. That's important because if you just try to take a piece of paper and have someone straddle it and try to hold it down, it's gonna, the vacuum's going to pull the paper up. It's going to give you a bogus reading of what's going on. So <clears throat> what we're going to do is use the sawdust as a blueprint to tell me exactly where this edger is cutting. When I touch it to that abrasive, it's going to remove the dust and that's going to tell me exactly where it's cutting at. All right, let's go down to the floor. What I do is I take the sawdust from the edger bag, I powder it up. I'm going to drop this down. I'm going to turn it on. What I'm going to make sure of is that my edger wheels are on the abrasive. Because if I don't, I, I've got my height is now distorted, isn't it? So I'm going to make sure that my edger wheels are turned and they're on the paper. I'm going to turn it on. I'm going to travel forward. Don't swing it side to side because you're going to flex the rubber. And it's going to give you a, a, a bogus reading of what's going on. My goal is to hit the first three rings and only the first three rings. That's all I want to hit. And we're going to find out right now. Now that edger pad's hitting the whole pad, isn't it? How easy is that going to be to control? It's not going to be at all, especially we're going to have cuts back here. So rather than move your wheels again, we don't do that. I'm going to take this edger, and the reason I have the height difference here, I'm going to let the caster wheels hang off the back, and I'm going to drop it down. It has a two degree angle of deflection, right? So the outside edge is not going to touch. It's just going to sand away the inside of that rubber pad. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Now you got to be hold on to this thing when you do it because it's going to try to push away from you, but it's no big deal. Anytime you, you hit the center, get a vacuum cleaner or something and get the hot dust out of there. Because what that will do, if that cools, it'll stick to the inside of those grooves and it'll throw it out of balance. So I'm going to get that all cleaned up. I'm going to take some dust and powder it up again. And cover the whole pad, even though we're trying to get the first three rings only. Cover the whole pad so you know what's going on. All right, if y'all can see, I'm hitting one, two, three here, and only two and a half there. So what that tells me is this edger is going to have a bounce to it because I'm not hitting that section right there. So I'm going to just dress it one more time. Now 
now we're consistent all the way around three rings. So when you put this edge around the ground and you operate it, you're not going to have any bounce. You're gonna, you can dial it in to cut where you want it at between, between 11.30 and 1.30, and that edge is going to be silky smooth. And that's, that's all I do. So you don't want the edger to cut flat because you try to take, a, take one of these grinders we're using and try to drop it straight down, it's going to push away, isn't it? You have to have that pitch. And you have to have that, utilize that two degree angle of deflection to your advantage. That's how, that's how easy that is. It takes a little bit of practice, but once you got it, you got it. So that's it. How many times, how many times can you dress a pad? Truthfully, maybe twice, because what happens is you don't wear the rubber out. Honestly, you're gonna hit a staple or a nail or a tack strip. You're gonna take the front of that edger pad away and chew it up. That's the negative to the rubber pad. If you hit a staple or nail or something, it's done. So the steel plates, you're only gonna tear the Velcro face off, that's it. And you can put a new Velcro on and be done. You don't have to change your adjustments or anything. So that's why this now has a metal plate available for it or the rubber pad. A lot of guys still like the rubber pad. I have the flex pad on my edger. But that's, that's uh, personal preference in that regard. Any more questions? It's, rubber's more aggressive, going to leave a heavier scratch. The metal one's going to be less aggressive, leave a finer scratch. But you can make up for that, and that's why you're here at the advanced class. The type of mineral you use is, can completely change your machine. I can have 10 pounds of head pressure with a silicon carbide and not have an aggressive scratch. I can go to a ceramic and get a more aggressive cut, more aggressive scratch. The zirconium and aluminum oxides and all those minerals by changing the mineral, I can make the machine more or less aggressive to do what I need to do on that floor. I don't want to be, this is maple, I don't want to be super aggressive. So I'm going to, I'm going to back off a little bit. So I might go to a silicon carbide on my mineral to leave a finer scratch instead of using something, what I call a high performance mineral. So that's why it's important to know the difference. Um, you're going to see all the different uh, mineral types here at this class, and that's why you come to the advanced class is to learn more about not how to operate the sander, but learn how you can utilize all this to your advantage. That's what it's all about.